Hospital. She's Director of Diversity and Inclusion at the Department of Surgery at Mass General Hospital. She's a thyroid surgeon with expertise in molecular biology, hundreds of publications, all in thyroid cancer therapeutics, imaging and treatment of hyperparathyroidism. She is active in a lot of organizations. I actually heard her speak at the Association of Women Surgeons, uh, which she was the head of. Um, and um, she has always been promoting a great promoter of gender equity and diversity in surgery and medicine. Um, so we welcome you uh, to our, our event tonight and um, I look forward to your, uh, your talk. Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you everyone for inviting me. It's been um, an absolute pleasure listening to everyone and all of the innovation that's going on is just fantastic. Um, so I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about myself so I'm not talking in a vacuum. Um, I immigrated uh, out of um, where I was born in Iran uh, due to the revolution in the 80s, uh, moved to Florence for a couple of years for high school, then moved to San Francisco eventually um, as a resident in surgery where I had my first son um, when I was a resident. I think I was the first um, surgical resident there to have a child during residency. Fast forward, um, this is the night that I became a professor at Harvard and my uh, youngest son got into college. Uh, we like to travel and do a lot of um, relaxing things together so we, we don't drive each other totally insane. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the pay gap in medicine and the inequity in pay for physicians. Mostly I'm gonna talk about what leaders can do and how they need to pay attention as well as a little bit about what medical societies can do. And I'm really not gonna talk about what individuals can do themselves to try to fix the pay gap today. So I'm gonna start off with this video. Um, uh, uh, many of you may have already seen this video. Uh, I, it's a little bit complicated to show it, but I think it's worth showing it. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, try to get it up now. Um, so let's see. Okay, so can you guys see this video? So this is a video that talks about fairness. You'll see the first monkey. And gives a rock and gets a cucumber. The other one needs to give a rock to us. Gives a rock and gets a grape, which is sweeter and more delicious. And she gets a grape. And she, she, the other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. Which is the least desirable treat. She tests the rock now. She, she wants to make sure she's more. giving the same damn rock back. Uh, she Still gets a cucumber. <laughs> well, I'm not going to belabor the point, but just to show that even monkeys understand fairness and what's important um, when it comes to fairness. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to sharing the talk here. I'm sorry that we're on Zoom, so things are not always as smooth as they should be. So it's clear from all the data that there is a large pay gap between women physicians and male physicians. Basically, in every single specialty, the red dots are getting paid less than the blue dots, except for radiology in one single specialty. It's um, almost equal. Uh, but in every other specialty, um, males, uh, the blue dots, are earning more. And in fact, the higher paid specialties, the bigger the gap in the pay. And overall, that's an $83,000 gap for female general surgeons, which at the end of a 30-year career translates so, to somewhere over $1.5 million to $2.5 million. In fact, in this article by the AAUW, which is an organization of university women, 
um, what it showed is that this, the largest number, uh, the largest amount of money left on the table for surgeons and physicians due to the pay gap is $19 billion per year. We're not talking over a lifetime here. Per year, female physicians are leaving $19 billion behind. So again, a very significant number. So what can, why should leaders uh, pay attention to this pay gap? Frankly, because it's been shown that organizations with pay equity have improved performance and greater trust in the leadership. And inadequate pay, just like the monkeys, is perceived as unequal compensation and correlates with dissatisfaction. So being a leader means that the leaders need to set the tone, identify the barriers to equity, and really understand what these barriers are, are and correct them. And otherwise, what they'll find is a very unhappy workforce, essentially, uh, which you know uh, is definitely true. And it's not just monkeys. Humans uh, definitely are unhappy. So you have uh, physicians who sue because their pay was cut. So for example, this is a female physician who sued um, uh, University of Pennsylvania successfully because her pay was cut by 80% when she became pregnant because they said you're not making your IVUs. And here again is a video that I want to share with you real quick, which was a, um, a session uh, on um, a publication that came out uh, in Texas that was meant to um, really show um, work. Um, I'm sorry, this is more difficult than I thought. So let me just stop sharing for a second. Can you all see this? All right, on this Labor Day, doctor. Can you see the CNN little video clip? So this is, this will pretty much explain it, so I won't talk over it because I think it's interesting. From female professionals after saying there's a gender pay gap in medicine because women, quote, don't work as hard. His name is Dr. Gary Tiguez. He made these remarks in the September issue of the Dallas Medical Journal. So I just want to read the whole thing for you, quoting the doctor. Uh, female physicians do not work as hard and do not see as many patients as male physicians. This is because they choose to, or they simply don't want to be rushed, or they don't want to work the long hours. Most of the time, their priority is something else, family, social, whatever. Nothing needs to be done about this unless female physicians actually want to work harder and put in the hours. If not, they should be paid less. Okay, Dr. Tiguez quickly realized he ticked off the wrong group of women, working moms, responding with tweets like this. I would love to fill in your knowledge gaps, but I'm tired from working 24 plus hours doing heart transplants. Based on national gender pay gap data, the last five hours of which I worked for free, I guess you think that's okay though, because I'm a mom of four. Uh, okay, so I'm not gonna belabor that either, but I just um, um, did wanna show that this is making national attention and getting national attention. And these issues are important. That physician actually ended up being removed from his position at the hospital uh, because of uh, this uh, faux pas, let's say. Um, so we, we've established that leaders do need to pay attention. Who are the leaders who need to pay attention to this? Uh, well, legislative leaders at the local and national level, hospital leaders such as presidents of hospitals, board of trustees and chiefs of staff, physician organizations um, and medical societies as well as industry. And of course, patients themselves also need to pay attention to this because this is important. Unfortunately, what we find when we look at many of these people at these levels of leadership, it looks like this, where there are a lot of men and not enough women. So again, another issue that we need to address. So what can leaders at the hospital level do? I call this the equal framework. Establish parameters and benchmarks 
quantify gaps, look at data on RVUs, rank of the people being uh, paid, support provided, um, and understand the drivers of pay, such as RVU, time and rank in promotions, and then hospital support provided. And then plan an action and then go ahead and lead the change. So I'm gonna give some examples of that right here in Massachusetts. So in 2016, Massachusetts passed a law which said that if you did equal work, you had to be paid equal amount of money. And they said that this law would be in effect July of 2018. And they gave people three years to basically um, be uh, uh, sort of as a uh, time where they could be in violation if they tried to fix it. Well, what happened? This law went into effect. Hospital leadership tried to push for equity by finding the barriers then and the chairs in the departments started looking at barriers and physicians started to understand what the barriers might be. And here's an example of a real life organization, the Massachusetts General Hospital Physician Organization, who saw this law coming and decided what to do. So here's the physician organization which pays the physicians. It's made out of 19 members that are rotating and elected eight women, 11 men, and four underrepresented minorities. I'm proud to say I think this is actually better than many physician organizations or hospital leaderships. So they hired actually an economist and legal counsel and a data auditor to try to figure out the data because as soon as they tried to figure it out themselves, they realized it was way too complicated. They started a transparent compensation plan for each department, which was really, really new and certainly was not the same exact plan for each department or division, but at least there was a plan. And they made sure that each physician had a clear understanding of the key considerations for the compensation plan and that each chair had a clear understanding of the key considerations for the initial salary. And each physician was given a copy of the compensation formula prior to hire and then reviewed each year. And then the idea was to relook at the metrics at five years. And what did this very, very deep dive show to the hospital leaders? Well, what it showed is that subspecialty representation was very important. In hospitals, males were choosing more lucrative specialties. The initial salary at the start of the career um, was not equal in physicians, male and female, and that it was apparent that both negotiation by female physicians was lacking, but transparency with the physicians was also lacking. Work RVUs, it was clear that female physicians were generating less RVUs, and we'll get into that in a minute and more women were working part-time. And then it was clear that this concept of professional esteem, professional rank, publications, and paid leadership positions were all definitely a lot less in females. So what, is, um, what was about the initial compensation? It included how much RVUs it was expected that the physician would generate, their collections and their payer mix, where they might be sent to outside clinics and whether they were paid for administrative roles or provided ancillary workers such as nurse practitioners um, or um, were, were whether they were asked to do service work that was free and not paid. Um, and then also the academic niche that they were given it was obvious that sometimes those things were not equal between female and male physicians. And then we'll talk a little bit about the work RVUs. It's clear that female physicians generate less work RVUs than male physicians. Um, and at first you might say that means women physicians just work less, just like that poor Texas doctor said. They generate less RVUs because they work less and they work part-time and they're attending to their social lives, just like I do. But if you really dig a little bit deeper, there's a lot of interesting facts that come out. First of all, in general, there's this idea of um, gender segregation. So it turns out if a job has a very, very few females, let's say around here, that job, especially if it's a high skilled occupation, pays much higher than if it has a lot more females. So a high skilled occupation with 100% females still pays um, more than uh, a skilled job, uh, an unskilled job, but basically the pay goes down 
when the ratio of women goes up in any job, whether it's a low skill job, a medium skill job, or a high skill job. So that's important to know because in surgical and other specialties, for example, OBGYN, you see it's a 54% woman and the mean salary is less than a specialty like urology where my husband is, where it's 8% woman, but the mean salary is 370,000. And this is true, for example, why teachers get paid so less when teaching was a job of males, the pay was much higher. And when it became a job where it's predominantly female, the pay went down. So now let's talk about this RVU. The RVU is called relative value unit. And this is how physicians get paid. Each procedure or item they do, like when I do a thyroid surgery, I get a certain number of RVUs for the procedure I do. The RVU is supposed to calculate how much work it takes me to do that surgery, the expenses in my practice and my non-practice costs. It's also supposed to include my technical skill, my judgment, my mental effort, my physical effort, and my psychosocial effort in doing that thyroid surgery. And it includes pre-service, intra-service, and post-service care of the patient. This RVU is then multiplied by a dollar conversion factor and set for reimbursement. So then the physician gets paid. So the RVU is set by the AMA. And this committee that sets the RVU for all physicians in the US has 31 members, 28 voting members. And of those 28 voting members, two are women. So less than 10%. 21 of the seats have been appointed by major national medical societies that you all are probably part of. So why is this so important? This is important because if you look at this data from this paper um, in Gyne Oncology in 2017, you can see that these researchers compared very similar surgical interventions and calculated their RVUs. So if you have a male patient and you biopsy the penis, the surgeon gets 1.9 RVUs. But if you biopsy the vagina, you only get 1.2 RVUs. If you remove a penile lesion, you get almost 11 RVUs. But if you remove a vaginal lesion, you get 2.7 RVUs. And I'm not gonna belabor it, but needless to say that 72% of the procedures that were virtually equivalent had higher work RVUs in the male compared to the female anatomy. And I mean, I don't know, but I would say the mental stress of biopsying a scrotal lesion is no more than biopsying a vulvar lesion, but you're getting 5.7 times more RVU, i.e. 5.7 times more money at the end of the day when you do that. And look at this paper that just came out, actually from MGH, where they looked at the operative and CPT codes and the work RVUs between all the surgeons that had operated, 131 surgeons between 1997 and 2008 in a large academic medical center. About 20% of the surgeons were female and 80% male. Um, overall, the female surgeons had 25% less RVU. So again, you might say it's because they're working part-time or they're lazy or whatever. But it turned out, actually, working part-time made no difference. In fact, bizarrely, in this data, men <laughs> worked more part-time than females. Choice of sus subspecialty made no difference. And looking at data from the most recent decade didn't correct it either. So overall, for um, work that was done, the same exact uh, work, surgeon trained the same exact way, in practice the same number of years, had the same subspecialty training, was not working part-time, the female surgeons were making less RVU per case. What does that mean? It means they're doing less complex cases than the males. If you look, there's, the females are almost doing no cases over 100 RVUs, whereas the male surgeons are doing tons of cases over 100 RVUs. And in every single specialty, except for one, the males did more than the females. 
And again, not to belabor it, but if you looked at every single procedure, whether it was the most recent decade or, or the previous decade, it didn't make a difference. It didn't make a difference if the females had been in practice more than 20 years, they still had less RVUs per case. And, um, and again, like I said, the subspecialties didn't make a difference. So I won't talk too much about the professional esteem issue, which is the rank of the physicians in terms of promotion, except to say that overall, when you have the same number of females and males entering medical school and the same number graduating and the same number in residency, once you start promoting um, and you get to assistant, there are almost equal number of male and female, but as you go down towards full professor and tenure and chair, the number of uh, male physicians just keeps going up who are tenured. Uh, and full professors, and the number of female full professors just goes down and down. And it's the same thing if you look at um, females and males, um, the women tend to have less, um, and, uh, and I'm sorry, this is um, looking at sex differences in surgical faculty, what you can see is even if you have the same number of women having NIH grant, the same number of publications, the same number of first and last author papers, you still are getting uh, a lot of women who are getting paid less. So what are some action plans that can be done? One, one example that um, we have studied is developing an annual pay equity report by division making sure everyone in the department understands the compensation plan, making a transparent compensation plan, developing an annual promotion track record that compares females to males in the department with overall statistics, and then also identifying leadership roles with succession plans so they can be moved on to other physicians, and then making sure that females are put into those positions and have the ability to do the leadership. Um, I will say that I think the MGH physician organization through this exercise has done a very good job. This past um, year, they actually sent every physician a report on compensation. And one of the uh, point, uh, parts of the um, compensation report, which was six pages long, telling everyone how they were compensated and how everything was calculated, was one page on compensation and gender bias, which I think was very, very important. Societies such as the Association of Women Surgeons and the American Surgical have now also started talking about pay equity, and I think that's important. Sometimes you really do need help from old white guys, such as usually are the leaders of these societies to help uh, move this needle forward. Um, and I'll just talk briefly about the elephant in the room. What usually comes up at medical societies and, and these boardrooms is that if you pay males or females more, you're gonna have to pay males less. That's usually what comes up is the money is a fixed budget. Where is it gonna come from? If we start paying females more, then we're gonna have to pay um, males less. And I'm just gonna look at these two papers. Um, so one is from the American Journal of Surgery, and they looked at 13 specialty surgeons in the VA system. They had salary data on 2,000 of them through the federalpay.org website. 20% were female, 77% were male. And through multivariate analysis, they showed that faculty rank was not an independent predictor of salary and that males and females had the same salary, um, including mid-career females who had a little bit of a lower pay, but almost everyone else had equal pay. So we know, at least in the VA system, it is possible to have equal pay for physicians. And we know that publicly available data, um, for example, this transparency can lead to less secrecy around salary, and that there is a tier-based system for determining pay with four tiers with clear definitions of responsibilities and professional achievements, which put you into a pay tier. We also know from this paper and other papers um, that I, I don't have time to quote here, but that from this paper from University of Alabama, 
they started out by looking at the physicians in their organ surgeons in their department of surgery. Um, this is one of my friends who's a chair there, Herb Chen. And what they saw was that the males were getting paid um, a lot more than the females. In fact, the females were getting paid 46 cents on the dollar, the female surgeons compared to the males. They put some interventions in place which increased the pay and made it more equitable. But what's interesting is that both of the salaries went up, both for the males and for the females. So what you can see is that basically prior to their intervention compared to the double AMC recommended salary for their specialty and years in practice, females were making VIT here compared to the double AMC salary, which would be here. And males were not there either. They were closer, but not there. And after the compensation plan transparently put in place, females moved way up past where the males had been. Males moved up afterwards above the double AMC rate. So I guess I'll just conclude that, you know, overall we cannot succeed when half of us are held back. This is important, money talks, money's important. And I'm thankful to the MGPO leadership and the financial people at, MGA, at MGH, um, as well as the economist who helped look at this data. Um, and Dr. Caprice Greenberg, who got me thinking about this issue, as well as the Association of Women Surgeons. But mostly thanks to all of you for um, inviting me um, to give this talk. I know it's probably really, um, difficult to listen to this talk at the end of a long day, but I appreciate your invitation. Well, terrific. Dr. Prangi, I want to thank you for being our keynote. That was, um, I've, I heard you speak before and I knew it was uh, just as uh, compelling the, the second time I've heard this, but it is uh, really important data for all of us to uh, tend of digest. And, um, and I think it's, it, I think for many, it's surprising, even among the women. Um,